family. We are so excited to bring the second season of Theology and 30 to the Hope TV. Just a little history. Theology and 30 was birthed in 2018 and I hosted a few episodes on Facebook and Instagram. So I have to thank our senior pastor and executive producer of the Hope TV, Dr. E. Dewey Smith Jr. for the opportunity to bring Theology and 30 back for a second season. Thank you, pastor. So the purpose of Theology and 30 um, it basically evolved out of my desire to engage in theological discourse with my friends, colleagues, mentors, family, and people who are just curious about theology. So I want to pause here full stop to say you don't have to be a preacher or a theologian to enjoy Theology in 30. And so I want to pause right now to thank our supporters. You've been rocking with us for almost two years, and we, we just want you to know that we appreciate your viewership and your support. So y'all know what I need y'all to do. Y'all know how we, how we roll on Theology in 30. I need y'all to talk to me. Talk to me in the comments. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're watching from. And also feel free to share some questions if you have any. We'll try to answer them live in the chat. Yes, live in the chat while you are watching. Finally, we want to grow our viewership, so we need your help. Um, I need our viewing audience to do two things. First, follow us on Instagram at The Hope TV. And second, we'd like you to share the link of this episode from our page to yours, because we know that what we're going to share is not just for those who are watching, but for people in your network, for people in your family, for people who are just curious about God and theology. Thank you so much. So let me introduce our content for tonight and our guest. Reflecting on the work of Dr. James K. on homiletical theory, Dr. Frank Thomas talks about the idea that in preaching, we usually have conversation partners or frames of reference that shape how we develop our, pre our preaching methodology. So for those who are watching, if you study homiletics formally, those of you who are watching who are not familiar, if you study homiletics formally, um, there's a such thing as your preaching methodology, which is the way that you form your sermons and the way that you preach. So for some, the conversation partners are philosophy and theology. For others, it's womanist thought and theology or music and theology. And so our guest tonight, similar to Dr. Leo H. Davis, my uncle, shout out to Uncle Leo, who was on here a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Um, our guest tonight may be one of the clearest examples of a preaching voice and musician who represents the best of both worlds in terms of an awareness of how music theory and theology um, work as conversation partners in the practice of preaching and ministry. So I'm really excited about our guest tonight. We have none other than Dr. John Paul McGee in the studio with us. Uh, Dr. McGee is the current assistant chair of piano at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. So let me stop right there and let that sink in for our Theology and 30 audience. I'm gonna say it again. Dr. McGee is the current assistant chair of piano at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. That is so huge. Um, raised in Baltimore, Maryland, at the age of four without any formal training, he began to play familiar hymns and church songs by ear. So he's been um, really a prodigy from the very beginning. Dr. McGee's mother, aware of his special gift, made the sacrifices necessary to ensure that he received official music training and development. So shout out to mom for that. Uh, Dr. McGee studied piano and pipe organ under the renowned Dr. Nathan Carter and graduated in 2002 from Baltimore School for the Arts. Um, he's been recognized for numerous awards and his musical career has taken him around the globe as a keyboardist, vocal arranger, producer, and songwriter working with popular gospel and secular artists ranging from Patti LaBelle and the Isley Brothers to the Clark Sisters, Vashon Mitchell, Kimberell, and Dr. Ernest Pugh. His instrumental piano album released in 2018, I need y'all to go download it right now with EPM Records and it yielded him a spot as a top 
10 Billboard Recording Artist. I can go on and on and on, uh, but he has earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in music with a concentration in piano performance from Bethune-Cookman University. Shout out to any Bethune-Cookman graduates who are watching Theology in 30. Um, he has a Master of Arts in Religion from Liberty University and a Master of Sacred Music uh, with a con uh, with a concentration in pipe organ performance from Emory University, my alma mater. And most recently, um, he has been awarded a doctorate of ministry degree with a concentration in pastoral care and counseling from the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. We have um, a legend in his own right with us on Theology and 39. So Dr. McGee, Will you say hello to our Theology in 30 audience? Hello, Theology in 30. What, what I'm going to have to pay you to start introducing me wherever I go because- Let's go. That, let's go. <laughs> no, really, I am so honored, Pastor uh, Jennifer Connor, to be here with you, my sister, and just grateful for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this amazing platform of theological engagement, reflection, and discussion. Shout out to, of course, the, the legendary senior pastor of the House of Hope Atlanta. Dr. E. Dewey Smith as well for this just amazing opportunity to be here to share with you. So thank you for your kind introduction and hey, Theology and 30 fam, it's good to be here tonight. So this is his first time, but y'all already know it's not gonna be his last time uh, because I don't think we can fit everything that he knows into this 30 minute time frame. So we're just gonna jump in with it. I wanna start out by asking you because you have such a unique gift of both piano uh, organ performance, but also preaching, right? Um, so I want to know, what do you love most about your ministries of music and preaching? Um, I love the opportunity to be limitless in the expression of the gospel message. Um, I'm able to express it uh, through oration, sermonically, uh, through public speaking in non-ecclesial contexts, but also through what is deemed the universal language, which is music. And um, I have this gift from God to be able to express the message of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, the power of God through uh, both mediums. And so, um, you know, I'm really grateful and the opportunity to even converse about and to reflect on what God has given me, the weight of it, the immensity of it. Um, it is truly humbling um, because I'm able to go in several different directions to be able to expand and extend the kingdom of God and to reach throughout the world. So we know that there are lots of blossoming uh, fields that span across music and theology. We know about ethnomusicology, right? We know about theomusicology. So I want to ask you, if you were to name and describe your theology when it comes to preaching, your theology of preaching, and if there's a claim that emerges again and again in this practice of music and preaching, uh, what would it be? What would be your theology of preaching if you could articulate it for us? It's crazy. You used two of my favorite terms, one ethnomusicology, because at one point in my career, I wanted to be an ethnomusicologist and thought about pursuing a, D, uh, a PhD in ethnomusicology. Um, and I've done quite a bit of extensive study, particularly in my dissertation uh, about theomusicology. And so I find myself kind of in, in between both spaces uh, uniquely because as an unapologetic and unashamed um, Afrocentrist, um, I look at the practice of music uh, from an African birthed originating perspective. Um, and so I, in my dissertation, I looked at the Mbira, M-B-I-R-A, which was the original thumb piano that was played uh, by ear as a solo instrument without accompanying vocals um, and its impact and its effect on communicating messages and bringing a sense of calm and relief and soothing to the mind and spirit. But at the same token, wow. um, I also find myself in this theomusicological space where music and theology, the study of God are, are, are partnered together. And, and so 
um, I almost forgot what you about to ask because I'm about to run down a rabbit hole. What was the question again? So <laughs> I loved your answer, uh, but <laughs> I was asking you about your theology of preaching. What is your God claim that emerges in your practice of music and preaching? Right. So with all of that said, looking yes. at uh, the ethnic, the indigenous ethnic roots and retentions of African inspired music, as well as looking at theomusicology, both the study of music and theology, I would offer that in my preaching, in the oration of my preaching, um, it's highly pneumatological. Yes. You know, of course, I was raised Baptist, so I do have a high Christology, this understanding of Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Um, but I would offer that my pneumatological um, bent is even a bit higher than my Christological bent in that in Genesis, before God spoke, we find the spirit of God hovering. There was sound before there was speech. And, and so... <laughs> And, and so this whole uh, idea of divine encounter with the spirit emerges throughout my preaching, no matter what I'm preaching about, this whole idea, the spirit in us that bears witness with the spirit of God and causes us to be able to live out the life of Christ um, in our everyday uh, walk with the Lord. But when I'm in, in preaching, particularly even as a pastor, when I was pastoring a local church, um, I would find myself always getting to this space of you need an encounter with the Holy Spirit in order for you to walk and live out these practical principles, whether they be on giving, whether they be on generosity or hospitality, this understanding of um, just how to live a balanced Christian life. We can only do it through the Spirit. And, I, and so as a musician, as I preach through music, particularly this whole idea of improvisation, right? Uh, which a lot of people attribute to jazz, but it really goes all the way back to the motherland, right? Where there were no scores. And it was birthed out of this experience, this, tact this, this intangible experience with the divine, but this tactile experience with a drum or an embira or some other type of musical instrument that was then able to express message. Right. So it, it comes as no strange thing to me that as a musician, as an improvisatory musician who began playing by ear, by the spirit's prompting, that that same notion carries itself out through my preaching oration. Right. So even as I am studying, because, again, seminary trained and all that, even as I'm studying and even as I'm seeking to be um, hermeneutically accurate and to make sure that homiletically the sermon is as tight and uh, creatively expressive as it should be. I always find myself asking God for an encounter in that moment. And then God allow my encounter that I have with you in this moment to be readily accessible to the people who would receive it in whatever space I'm sharing. So much about the faith community, um, some positive, some negative, and if you look on a lot of uh, platforms, there's a lot of uh, bickering back and forth in the faith community about who's right, and who's wrong, what to believe. So let's just talk about something. What, um, what do you think the faith community or the church role is in our society right now? What's the role, in your opinion, of the, of the faith community? I think the role in the faith community right now is to give hope. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's, there's a lack of hope. I won't say there's no hope right now, but in my opinion, there's a lack of hope. When it comes to making plans, you are the best. Remember the best planned 90 minutes of your life? Or that surprise party for your parents' golden anniversary? You get the golden planning. 
The same way you plan each detail for those moments, start planning to protect you and your loved ones from a natural disaster. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Prepare an emergency kit and make a family communications plan. Protecting your family is the best plan you can make. Night of fire. balloons right now because you just signed that is amazing can Thank you share you. with us that experience god's major assignment is people not platforms a lot of times god will release us and he'll even release us to the nations but because the platform doesn't match we think we're waiting but god say no i least i released you to a people if there are people in front of you you've, you've been doing it You've been answering the call. Don't allow the level or either the size of the platform to cause you to misinterpret what God has already done. We're ready for what God wants. God, we are lost in darkness. So just just pause because we all need to recover. Oh, my God. You so first I need our audience, if you have not shared this video on your social media platforms, you need to do it right now because Dr. McGee is blessing us. Um, he's delving not just into uh, theomusicology, but I hear you delving into some indigenous religion, um, Africana spirituality, epist Africana epistemologies, which is something that I'm very passionate about. So to hear you speak, that language is exciting to me. So let me confess, Dr. McGee, I am studying for comprehensive exams in October. Um, so I solicit your prayers. And yes, I'm praying. One, <laughs> one of the things that we're doing right now in our preparation process is we are thinking critically about theologies of preaching and homiletical theory. And so what I will say is your articulation of your homiletical theory and theology of preaching, I think is very relevant for where we are. Um, something that I've been saying the past few months is that worship never really needed an address because we were worshiping in the hush harbors. We were mm -hmm. worshiping in the fields. And so when we began to think about what the pandemic has done in decentralizing the idea of place of worship, um, I think what you're saying is so important that we, we're thinking about the Holy Spirit enabling us to now live into our, our discipleship and this yes. new way in Christ Jesus. So um, that, was, that was awesome. Thank you for that. I want to move to ask you a little bit about you. Because you are uniquely gifted in both uh, piano performance, organ performance, all things arranging, um, but also in preaching, you know what I'm going to ask. Which <laughs> gift you feel the most at home in? Because to me, when I watch you, I did watch a couple of your videos to prepare for tonight. Um, you seem to be at home in both elements equally. So we, we Theology in 30, we, we want to know. <laughs> which one which one is, is is your favorite? Which one do you feel the most at home in? Such is the nature of the Spirit of God that when God gifts you with a good and perfect gift that's from above, you you find yourself settled in whatever space. So when I saw that question in preparation, I was like, Lord, give me a, a very simple way to to answer it. And really was given to me in a vision. I saw myself sitting at a piano. And then I saw myself standing in the pulpit. And wherever I sit or stand, I am most comfortable. What? Yeah, but, that's <laughs> by, but that's by the work of the Spirit. Come on, wherever. Not because me, the not Spirit. Not me, yeah, because of the Spirit, because of the Spirit, because it's the Spirit's gift, um, I don't find myself gravitating to one or the other and because it's the spirit's gifting and and commission uh for my life 
Um, mm -hmm. I did not find it necessary as some of my colleagues and even predecessors who began in music ministry to make this market transition out of music ministry to pursue what is perceived as a higher calling. I find that wherever God spaces you is the highest calling for that moment in that space. So I didn't need to be elevated beyond music to the pulpit. I'll say that again. I didn't need to be elevated beyond music to the pulpit, nor do I feel demoted when I sit behind an organ or sit behind a piano. Uh, wherever God grants me space, I find comfort and joy and peace and serenity in knowing that I'm able to express this kingdom gospel message uh, through the gifts that have been given to me. And so I had to get over uh, wanting a carbon copy journey to some of my friends and brothers and sisters in ministry, um, you know, and in music. And to realize that God is carving out this very unique journey that is uncharted and that is unprecedented. And um, I would have never thought that um, a year after ending an assignment of pastoring for five years, that I would then be moved to pastor in the current position as assistant chair at Berkeley College of Music. I'm, I'm still in the pulpit. My pulpit has just shifted. And one of the things that the Lord uh, showed me is that there are certain gifts that he has, again, planted within the four walls. I do not take anything away from those who are called to the temple, but there are other apostolic-ish gifts that have been given the world as their pulpit. And so I am really grateful to God that I'm able to express these ascension gifts and these gifts of music and worship in, in spaces like a Berkeley College of Music in Boston that needed kingdom agents in that space to advance not only musical cause, but also to fight against systems of oppression and injustice that are laden within our higher education systems all over this country. Come so on. God sends you there, not only just to be a musical voice and to give academic further academic credit to gospel music and to R&B and jazz as a form of academic study, but also to advance kingdom principles and to be able to help nurture and mentor people in some of the most tender seasons and spaces of their lives. And then God has given me the ability to travel and itinerate and assist other pastors and bishops in uh, helping to develop their church leaders and all of this while still being able to minister and, and sit down at the piano and play. So I love it. So if I'm playing Bach, I'm at home. And if I'm hooping in B flat, I'm at home. So, yeah. so that, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I could follow that rabbit trail a long ways when we start talking about hooping because a lot of my work, so my PhD work is, is going to be in the whole idea of folk preaching and how mm. folk preaching informs um, how we as preachers in modernity respond to the same rhetorical exigencies of hyperpatriarchy, liminality, racism, sexism, classism. We know what those are. Um, and so it's exciting to me to hear you talk about your body in a space being a mm -hmm. form of resistance and being a form of changing a system or being a way to change a system. So in essence, your being a pastor in this role of assistant chair is actually an embodied, an, an, a form of embodied rhetoric. Yes. Or, or, yeah. So you're using your very presence to speak and to evoke change. That's powerful. You know, I, I think it, essentially what you are saying, and I completely agree, is that our presence becomes the preached moment, not just what we say, but who we are in the spaces that God has uh, assigned us and given us uh, access to. It's funny, I'll share this very quick story. I recently recorded um, Gospel Jazzical Volume 1, which is a genre yes. of music that I've invented, yes. the trilogy of gospel jazz and classical. And so it was a very small live audience. Um, and my father 
who is a pastor in uh, Ohio, was there. And during all of my solos, he kept screaming out, preach. Yes. I wasn't saying a word. Woo. But my fingers were doing the talking. And my presence at that instrument and what the Holy Spirit was downloading through me in that moment to play onto wax and to play for the persons that were there, that that was the preach. And so it's it, it's funny because all of my friends made fun of that because uh, he literally the whole night preach. And I'm like, Dad, I wasn't preaching, but yeah, I was. So let's stay right there. I'm glad you mentioned your your last recording because at the end, I want you to tell us how we can access your music and how we can support you. Um, but for me, you you might be able to relate to this. Preaching is not something that just happens, but there is a preparation process, right, that comes along with it. And some people may not agree with this, but I believe that to become a better preacher, you do have to practice. Mm -hmm. So some people know this about me. Dr. Smith knows during the pandemic when I wasn't preaching, the times that I wasn't, I would go to the loft of our administrative area and I would preach in the loft on Saturday mornings because I didn't want to lose the ability to connect concepts and to project my voice in a certain way. I didn't want to lose that because I've been preaching on Zoom so much. I wanted mm -hmm. to still have that projecting and, and that breath support. You know about all of that. And yes. so I would just preach to no one in the loft of our administrative area on Saturday mornings. And that's a discipline that helped me to uh, be able to preach to the camera. Uh, when I started getting calls to just do the studio engagements, well, I wasn't intimidated by that experience because I've been preaching in this empty room during the pandemic, not knowing that ministry was going to shift in that direction. So my question for you is, you, you have to practice. In order to produce the kind of music that you produce and the kind of preaching you produce, you have to practice. So talk to us about discipline, because I know there are some musicians watching who are saying, Dr. McGee is, is in a class all by himself. I can't even aspire to be like him. But what would you tell a rising musician preacher who wants to be as skilled in their craft as you are? Um. I'll start with the preaching, then I'll move to the music. Um, as you were speaking, I began to think about how Jesus' parents found him in the temple at age 12, reading from the scroll and teaching as one who had been learned for many years uh, when he was, himself was only a few years old. Um, and had that moment not occurred, he might not have been as skilled at 30 to preach the Sermon on the Mount. Right. And so from 12 until 30, we really don't see or hear anything. But I believe that his experience in the temple sets a precedent that what you do, wow. you spend enough time doing it for a long time in obscurity. And eventually you will emerge as one who is highly skilled and highly effective. So as a preacher, the best time to preach is when you don't have an invitation. As a preacher, the best time to orate is when you're in your bathroom or in your room before your stuffed animals outside of the presence of others. That's how you develop your rhythm, your cadence. That is how you yes. discover your unique voice and how you choose to put words together because words matter. That's where you can study words, not just in a dictionary, but also in the thesaurus to understand that those of us who practice preaching and who have a passion and a love for the craft. We have a relationship, not just with biblical concordances and topical Bibles and scholarly commentaries, scholarly commentaries, scholarly commentaries. We have a relationship as well with the Sauruses because they teach us how to better access the linguistics of the English language, which is the most common language to us all who preach in the African-American tradition. Relative to music, um, I started playing by ear at four. My mother recognized that there was something in me that needed to be developed. And so she kept putting me in intentional spaces 
for development. And I was raised and reared by people who had their foot in my behind because they realized that it would be very easy for me to rest on having a raw talent and a gift and never really crack open my true potential by doing the work. And so I had to learn scales. I had to learn arpeggios. I had to learn to play the dead white men and the dead white women and the yeah. dead black men and black women. I had to yeah. learn that. I had to spend time around people who were in production and jazz and R&B and gospel um, before I got invited to the stage. And yeah, I had my moments where I was wondering, well, when is my turn? But I had to realize um, and eventually had to realize that my turn would come when I was prepared and that God was actually sparing me from investment. And one of the things that I see so much proliferated on social media and no shade um, to anybody who does this, but I see it proliferated. People post a lot of what they know how to do. And um, we find that it comes out being the same thing posted over and over and over again because their musical palette, their ministerial palette, their preaching palette has not been exposed to anything beyond what is limited directly in front of them. And so I had to realize that a part of the discipline and preparation is also making sure that I expose myself to that which is different and novel so that I don't partition myself or space myself in a place where um, I'm just doing the same thing over and over and over again or sounding like somebody else or repeating even some of the detrimental mistakes um, that others have made in these fields. You know, I tell people all, all the time, you learn better and you know better and you do better. Right. And so I take nothing away from our ancestors. Many of them knew what they knew and they did what they did very well. And many of us were taught uh, by persons who were extremely passionate, but we've come into deeper learning. Right. So as I learned more about piano pedagogy, I changed some of my approaches as I learn more and, and study more in the word of God and grow theologically because I'm a process theologian. Um, I do believe in the evolution of theological thought that nothing is yeah. particularly, you know, directly fixed. Psalms, some of the foundational truths of the gospel. Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves. He's the way, the truth, and life. But as you grow, you do. And what I've learned is that as I committed to growing, God has given me more opportunities to do. So I, I share that with those who are looking for more opportunities. Commit to growth. I, I, I love that. You preach in the loft by yourself. I love that. I love that. My Shiro doesn't always wear a cape, but she always has time for a hug, a smile, for going the extra mile. My Shiro stretches every dollar, puts in long hours, puts others first. But now it's your time, Mom. When you're ready to retire, we want you to be able to enjoy it. It's time to start saving now. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. Visit aceyourretirement.org slash Shiro. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Single In. When we do think about building relationships, even professionally, mm -hmm. it comes from consistent delivery effort. on promises and efforts. See, it is kind of like an insert, almost like a peekaboo, like, what would my life be like with this person? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like... That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, you know, like, besides sex and in the sight of God and taking vows in front of all those that you love, what's the point of getting married? Have a great night. This is Single in the City. We'll see you next week. Strike.
it's interesting that you brought up this whole idea of process theology, because for so long I was a systematic theologian and I'm still on the fence. You know, I'm not fully, I haven't fully crossed over to process theology, but one thing that preaching to a camera or a screen does for you is it causes you to do some intentional theologizing Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have the touch your neighbor. Um, so there have to be ways in which you're communicating a thought that resonate mm -hmm. with people who are not in the room with you. So there's a sense of clarity that develops when we dedicate that time to not only, I think you said, use the thesaurus and those biblical tools that help us to study the, the gospel, but also there has to be some intentional thinking and theologizing mm -hmm. around our practice, whether it be in music or preaching. So Theology and 30 audience, I hope y'all are taking notes because Dr. McGee is teaching in here tonight. So I want to ask you this question. Is there anything about your practice of preaching and musicianship that you would like us to know? Like some little known facts, um, even some quirks that you may have, because one thing that I know about people who are artistic is that uh, we think and we, we see things differently than others at times. So is there anything about you in your musicianship or preaching that people would miss that you want us to know? You know, um, David shows us the power of wearing your own armor, right? Mm. And so, um, he took off Goliath's armor or took off the Philistine's armor and put it in and went with his slingshot and passed through the stones. And so uh, that shows to that shows me the power of tools. I need the tools that I need to be successful. So if you ever invite me, don't invite me to play somewhere with an untuned piano. I can't. Come on. <laughs> I, I Come can't. On. You know, I, I need the tool to be successful. You know, if you invite me. It, and your piano's on tune, rent a keyboard. You know, that, that's kind of a quirky thing about me and not a Casio or a Kurzweil, a Yamaha in his name, right? <laughs> that's so, you know, quirks. You, you said you want to know quirks, so that, that, is, a, that is a quirk. Um, another quirk, uh, this is kind of, this is really just, this ain't nothing deep about this, is I cannot drink a lot before I preach water yes. or tea or anything yes. because my mouth will start to water while I'm preaching. Yeah. And I have had yeah. some not so yeah. mm -hmm. I've had some not so good experiences uh with that. So I try my best to hydrate uh, within 24 hours or so of the experience so that I'm not chugging water, you know, 15, 30, 45 minutes prior to you know, and essentially, again, when we talk about preparation, it's like that would be akin to a pianist trying to play their whole hour and a half long recital right beforehand in the sound check. Something's, you know, you, you need your muscles to rest and to relax and to be in their proper working space in order for you to be successful. So, yeah, th those are a couple little quirks in terms of our physiological care. But again, when we talk about embodiment, that's when it becomes really deep. You got to know yourself and what is necessary for you to be healthy in standing in the space. Yeah, you so. Know, we really, yeah, you, you're delving into some. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, and, and I, I was thinking, let's see, you know, knowing yourself, and we've talked about this relationship uh, between preaching and music, you know, you got to know your key. And you may not be a musician. If you're a hooping preacher, it's important for you to know your key, right? And if you don't travel with your own musician, it might be who you, depending on where you are, to ask the musician, can you play in such and such key? Because we still have situations around here where not everybody plays <laughs> in all 12, right? So we, we need to make sure, you know, that we have the right tools to be successful. And nowadays they got hoop triggers and all types of contraptions and stuff. You can carry your own hoop with you. Contraptions, yes. <laughs> Contraptions and devices. Yeah. You know, I think how we show up in this space and how we care for ourselves holistically 
is very important. So it is important for you to know the quirky things, you know, about you. Another quirky thing, I'll just put this out there, you know, for those of you who may invite us to preach, right? I love the fruit basket, but we can't take the basket back with us. And so, you know, I'd be feeling bad because I'd be leaving all types of fruit on these hotel desks for the uh, housekeeping folk. Because, I mean, you're going to give these humongous fruit baskets and towels. And, but I, I do keep the snacks. I put the snacks in my bag. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, just little quirky things. Things that make it fun out here. Yes. I keep the snacks. Uh, <laughs> you made me laugh because um, I was traveling, I think, last week. I was in Philly and, and also Detroit. And the musicians and I got along really well because I knew it was an F week and not an A flat week. Uh -huh. I just knew that. I knew that. And, and so, because my allergies, you know, I'm, a, I'm an allergy sufferer. So I knew if I was gonna modulate four times, if the Lord so led me in that direction, I have to start an F. Or yeah. if I start an A flat, y'all gonna get two modulations and that's it. <laughs> that's it. We gonna, we gonna say, and let us stand. So, you <laughs> You have to know those things about you. Um, in addition, I want to share this because you you triggered all of this for me. Um, air conditioning. I know for me, if, if it's too cold, I can't, for some reason, my hoop, it's kind of thin. If mm -hmm. if my voice, my vocal cords are cold, then um, I, there's just certain things I can't do vocally. So people don't know that. They don't know that there's a whole um, regimen. There's a discipline. There's an awareness that comes along with us being our best selves in the ministry moment. Um, eight hours of sleep. Come on, come on in here. It's a quiet church yeah. tonight, yeah. but eight hours of sleep gotcha. changes what you can do vocally yes. and what you can do in the preaching moment. Um, I've learned that cardio is blessing my mm -hmm. life. Um, so getting those 45 minutes of cardio in Monday through Friday is my workout schedule help it helps me on sunday morning so all mm -hmm. of these all of these things all of these uh routines and all of these habits healthy habits inform us in the preaching moment and people would never know that so thank you for sharing that and in the musical yeah. moment you know if, if yeah. my hands are cold, if my hands are cold i don't play well and i've had sessions where the, the air conditioning has been just too crazy wild in the studio and I've had to ask them to cut it off and I've had to wait for a while until my hands can can warm up. But I mean, it's the same principle. It's it, of, of understanding the power of atmosphere, right? Yeah. That that's important yeah. for music and for preaching. In my office now, I have an amazing Yamaha C3 piano. Oh, but I have to keep my office at like 72, 73 degrees because if I take it below then, it sends my piano out of tune. If I have the room too hot, it sends my piano out of tune because it causes the, the strings to either expand or contract. The same principle is true with our muscles, with our vocal folds, depending on the atmosphere that we expose them to, which is why it's important that we cover up, which is why old Baptist preachers would get finished and they would have their cake, right? Because they want to be, you got to be covered up, right? So, so that, so that your folds and so the folds of your voice, and again, understanding, you know, when you perspire quite a bit, you know, and your pores are open, you become more susceptible to illness and sickness and all of those types of things. And th these are, are, are principles that span across the genres and the practices of preaching and music that are really, really important for all of us to understand and embody as we know ourselves, our gifts and what we need in order to um, effectively uh, express the gospel. And so hopefully those of you who are watching, you hear some of this stuff, you don't think that preachers or musicians are just trying to be grand or trying to be extra. But if you went to work and your computer didn't cut on tomorrow, you would have to sit there and wait until somebody came to fix it in order for you to work. And so this is not just a high calling. It is also for many of us, a vocation and a profession. And we have to make sure that we keep ourselves in working order. There's a, um, I forget the name of the Scottish preacher 
who said that God gave him a horse to ride and a message to carry. And on his deathbed, he said, alas, I've killed the horse so I can no longer carry the message. And the horse he was talking about was his body. He says, I didn't treat my body right. And so now I'm unable to uh, express this gospel message that I'm so passionate about because I didn't care for the horse. And many so of us walk around carrying, talking about our sermons are the stick or the horse. And we don't realize that the sermon is not the stick of the horse. It's our body. We have treasure within our earthen vessels. The earthen vessel is a treasure as well, but we have the treasure on the inside of the vessels. So we have to take care of both treasures. So this, first of all, amen. And Ashe. Um, Ashe. This is the part. This is the part of theology and 30 that I hate uh, because we have run out of time. So I dare not, I dare not try to close your, your message that you shared with us through embodiment and through speech. And even you've even functioned in the prophetic tonight. So I want to pause and just give you an opportunity to give us some parting words. How can we support you? How can we download your music? Um, just kind of tell us what's around the corner. If you can tell us I what's can. next, tell us what's next. In the way of parting words, I was able to uh, author a book back in 2019, and it's entitled Elevate. It's a 21-day devotional. And in one of the chapters, I made a statement that I live with every day, which is everything you need is either in you or around you. And the principle comes from Genesis. God sets Adam and Eve in the midst of the garden, and he says, look, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. The only way that they could be fruitful and multiply is if they came together. It shows us the power of interdependence and connection and relationship. And they both had the anatomical tools to make sure that fruitful multiplying happened. But also in terms of being able to survive and thrive, everything that they needed was around them. And so I want you to know that everything that you need, everything that you, uh, every resource, every tool for you to become is not external, it begins internal. And those things that you need, that you may not possess, God will make sure that you cross the path of the person who becomes the yin to your yang, person or person. So being all that said, I want you to be the best you you can be. Elevate and allow the Holy Ghost uh, to manifest itself through you in your uniqueness and whatever spaces uh, those unique ways are manifested. Um, in terms of being able to keep up with me, um, I'm excited that in August, this project, Gospel Jazzical Volume 1, will be released. I'm um, recently signed artist to Jazz Urbane, which is a jazz record label um, based here in Boston, Massachusetts. So, so excited about the opportunity to chart both on jazz radio and on gospel radio at the same time. God is absolutely wow. amazing. So be wow. on the lookout for Gospel Jazzical Volume 1. Amber Bullock, Zebulon Ellis, Pastor Wendy Wyatt yes. are all featured on the record. It's going to be an amazing piece. Um, as well as my Christmas album from several years ago, you can find that on iTunes and all platforms. Uh, Christmas with John Paul, uh, really grateful for that first work that entered me into this space of being an instrumental artist, um, preaching all over the place, doing leadership development, working as a consultant for several ministries. So check us out on our social media. You'll find out where I am and what I'm doing and hopefully coming to a city uh, near you to share in either of these amazing gifts of preaching and music. Thank you so much for having me, Pastor Connor. I wish it was Theology in 60. I know we got to go. But uh, it's been such a pleasure sharing with you. And we know we share some very, very special people in common. And so it's really such a blessing to be able to uh, now connect with you as well. You all have a gem in Pastor Carner. She's amazing um, as the executive pastor there at the House of Hope. And you all, of course, know you've got an amazing gift as a pastor in Dr. E. Dewey Smith, who also marries uh, both music and preaching together in this same in, in the same way that we've conversed. So Dr. McGee, I just want to say thank you for accepting our invitation mm -hmm. and thank you for being so open with us and thank just you. being so wise in, in how you articulated not only your craft, but your calling. 
And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, this is Theology in 30 on the Hope TV. And I am a part of the House of Hope where we believe that life with God is better in every way, every day. Thanks for watching, family, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.